this lecture I put together uh, a couple years ago. I saw the 400th anniversary is coming. I have quite a background in uh, Plymouth and uh, Plymouth Plantation, which I won't get into right now. Uh, but I thought I'd put together this lecture. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, been a, a great month. I've been giving this all month, and people seem to be receiving this very well. So let's start out here. Now, what you're looking at is my website. And uh, I know I'm not the best web designer, um, but if you go onto my homepage at dailyhistory.com, you'll see that there's a little booklet that you can download. It's a Google Doc. And that's because this lecture is not just a historical lecture, it's also a geographical and topographical lecture. And this booklet is really, it's, it's kind of a guide to all these sites that you're gonna be hearing about. Let me show you an example page here. And uh, we're going to be hearing about all sorts of sites. And the thing is, I'm, a, I'm kind of a, a tactile historian. I, I need to go out and touch things. I need to be in these places. And whenever I study history, I want to go visit the places that I've read about or seen. And this booklet is great because you can go to these places that you're going to hear about. It costs nothing. I'm not trying to hawk any kind of book here. You can just go on my uh, website and download it. So, uh, again, that's dailyhistory.com. Now, uh, this is something I usually show at my live lectures, and this can go uh, today, too. At the end of the lecture, we'll have a little Q&A if you'd like to do that. Uh, but as far as right now, we need to keep those mics muted, and uh, we'll go through this lecture here. Now, most of the quotes that you're going to hear are from a little booklet called Mort's Relation that the Pilgrims put out uh, about a year after they, they arrived to kind of advertise the, the colony. It was written by, it, it's thought to be a, written by Edward Winslow and William Bradford. And also you hear quotes from the quintessential book by William Bradford of Plymouth Plantation. All dates that you see in this lecture are old style, uh, just to keep it consistent. And you may see some variants on uh, some of the slides uh, that kind of contradict what I'm saying. It's because uh, there's a difference between old style and new, new style of about 10 or so days. Now, let's begin. Who are the pilgrims? And, and you know, it's kind of sad because People in this country, their knowledge of the pilgrims is basically this, what these kids see. They dress up uh, in elementary school, and usually it's around Thanksgiving, and they have a little dinner, and they learn that the pilgrims came here seeking religious freedom. From what? From whom? We don't know, uh, usually. Uh, and then they have this big feast, and that's it. Let's move on to the revolution. But, you know, it's kind of sad because there's so much more to the Pilgrim story than just Thanksgiving uh, and, uh, you know, the little hats and the funny dresses and stuff, which actually are pretty inaccurate. Uh, this is really what we should be talking about. The, the Pilgrims, were, a lot of people make this mistake, too. They, they think that they were Puritans. They were not Puritans. They were actually separatists. And I'll just give you a little uh, background on what is a Puritan. Nobody really even knows what a Puritan is. Uh, why were they called Puritan? Why were they called separatist? For instance, let's start with this man. This is Martin Luther. He was a German monk. And he started what we now know as the Reformation. Basically, he saw some things that the Catholic Church was doing wrong. And he actually nailed a whole list of them to the Wittenberg Cathedral at Wittenberg, Germany. And uh, the Catholic Church didn't respond. They didn't fix those things. So he decided to create his own version of Christianity. This is the first time any European broke away from the Catholic Church. And he called it Lutheranism. This was the first Protestant religion or Protestant. They were protesting originally. Now, the Puritans come from this guy here. Let's back up a little bit. Now, after Martin Luther did that and he created uh, Lutheranism, this man was staunchly opposed to any kind of Protestantism. In fact, he wrote a book supporting the Catholic Church. And we now know, we know him as Henry VIII. If you don't know him, 
Uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> you should. Now, Henry VIII decided because he uh, could not get an annulment from the Pope that he would break away from the Catholic Church as well. This is after being a staunch supporter of the Catholic Church. And we know the rest of the story. He couldn't get an annulment, so he married Anne Boleyn, and then all the rest is history. Now, the thing is, he created this Anglican church, this Church of England, and for all intents and purposes, it looked almost identical to the Catholic Church, with one, one or two exceptions. Henry VIII was the head of the church, and you could get a divorce. If you look here, you're looking at a cathedral. It's, a, it's an Anglican cathedral. They, they use the same types of things that the Catholic Church uses, statues, chalices, the whole nine yards. Now, there were people in England that were following the Reformation, and they believed that uh, there, there was a deeper meaning to their religion. And they followed, uh, these people were called the Puritans. They wanted to purify the Anglican Church. And they followed this man. This is John Calvin. He, he came later. He was a, a Protestant theologian that believed that Christians should go back to the original Bible. And any decision made should be based on what that Bible said. Not on popes, not on conclaves, on just the Bible. If it wasn't in the Bible, you didn't do it. So these Puritans wanted to purify the Anglican Church and bring it to what Calvin saw as a, a pure Christianity, a fundamental Christianity. And they, they tried to do that. This ended up as a, a civil war later on. Now, the pilgrims were, were not Puritans, and they both believed in Calvinism, and Calvinism had this Bible, the Geneva Bible, which was translated from the Greek, and they had these very plain churches here. But the separatists didn't want to do any of that. They didn't want to try to uh, uh, purify the, the church. What they wanted to do was they just decided to leave and separate from the church. And that's what they did. This group of separatists in England had given up on purifying the Anglican church, and they left and they went to Holland. And they went to Holland because, quite like our own country, Holland had freedom of religion. So they knew they could go there. They had been persecuted in England, and they knew they could go to Holland, and they could practice it, their religion freely. Now, they ended up here in Leiden, Holland, and they spent several years here. Although they could practice their religion freely, they started to become very bothered because uh, their children— were becoming more Dutch and less English, just by virtue of being in that, that milieu, that culture. And they needed to go to a place where they could practice their religion and not be uh, connected to any other culture like they were here. So they were looking to America, but the problem was they didn't have any money. They couldn't get there until this happened. They came across this group called the Merchant Adventurers which I guess today you'd call venture capitalists. And they were looking for an investment. They were looking to invest in a colony in America that could send back fur, could send back fish, lumber, crops, anything. And this would be a good deal. They, what they agreed to do was finance the Pilgrim's Voyage over to America. And in return for several years, they would just get all this stuff shipped back to them which they could sell in England and get rich. Now, that was the deal. They decided to outfit two ships. One was the Mayflower and one was the Speedwell. And they left England. They set sail on August 5th, 1620, and they were headed for America. The only problem was they got out to sea and they found out very quickly that the Speedwell was leaking. It was unseaworthy, and they limped back into port and the sea well was just not going to make the voyage. So they had to make a decision here. Some people had to stay back in England, and some people could go on the Mayflower. So they basically jammed as many people as they could onto the Mayflower, and then they set out again almost exactly a month later, September 6, 19, I'm sorry, 1620. 
And the destination was America, but they were shooting for the colony of Virginia. Now, when we think of Virginia, we think of the state of Virginia, uh, the area around Chesapeake Bay. Back then, the colony of Virginia extended almost all the way up until to uh, New York. And they were shooting for the northern bounds of Virginia, which would be probably around where Manhattan is, Staten Island, but there was already a Dutch colony there. So they were going to be pretty close to the Dutch. But, you know, they uh, got blown off course. The seas were rough. It was late in the year. And they finally sighted land on November 9th, 1620. And that land they sighted wasn't anywhere near New York. It was Cape Cod. As soon as they knew they were off of Cape Cod, they decided to make a beeline for the south because they thought they could go south, go through uh, Long Island Sound, and they'd be in the area that they were shooting for. And they tried to do that. As, as you see from this map, uh, Captain Christopher Jones turned the ship south, but they hit, hit this area here. This is Pollock's Rip, which is some shoals off of Chatham, Massachusetts, which are very dangerous, and it was stormy out. And these shoals were just a couple feet below the water. And if, if the Mayflower had run aground on one of these things, we'd never hear this story. The ship would have went down there and then. Christopher Jones knew this, and he turned the, the ship around, and he headed north and headed for what now is Cape Cod Bay. And here is a satellite shot of Cape Cod. Let's focus in on where they were. And this is where they weighed anchor, as you can see, on November 11th, right out here. This is Cape Cod Bay, right within uh, sight of where uh, the town, the P-Town is right now, Provincetown. Now, when they first weighed anchor, there, there was uh, quite a, a discussion. Uh, they were outside the bounds of Virginia. That meant they were outside the bounds of British law. Some people... Uh, the so-called strangers, the people that were not separatists along with this, this group who were to be colonists, were quite happy. They, they were thinking, woohoo, there's no law. We can do whatever we want. But cooler heads prevailed, and they sat down and they decided to create a constitution for themselves, a temporary constitution until they could get a patent which would establish actual British law. And we know this constitution today as the Mayflower Compact. They designed it as a democratic government that would elect a governor, and any law that they passed would be done democratically. So when you go to school and they study the founding documents, they always point to the Mayflower Compact, although it was just a temporary stopgap until they could get a patent. With that solved, the attention was drawn to exploration. We want to land on this, on this Cape Cod, and we want to explore it. So on that same day, November 11th, they set foot on Cape Cod. Let's look at where they, where they came in. Here, here is about where the Mayflower was anchored, and they weighed uh, the, the longboat into the water, the famous shallop was actually in pieces below decks. And they rode in and landed just about right here. And if you're familiar with the area, this is about in back of the Provincetown Inn. Let's look at this map here. This is from my little booklet I made. Now, if you go to this location today, A marks the site of the actual landing. But there's a monument out there, and the monument is not at the actual landing because it would be in water, it would be on the beach, that wouldn't be smart. It's actually inland a little bit, uh, inside of a rotary here. And this, this uh, commemorates that first landing of the pilgrims on Cape Cod, just about where P-Town is today. And here's a satellite shot of where we're talking about here. Here's the beach where they actually landed, and here's where the monument is. And you can imagine that first landing after, after so much time at sea. Uh, it looks like they're, they're just uh, so happy to be there. But at the same time, they're wary. 
they don't know what to expect. They know that there are Native Americans out there. Here is the actual monument that is uh, within that rotary there near the Provincetown Inn. This marks the first landing, not Plymouth Rock, as a lot of people think. And here's the actual beach site. Now, a few days later, almost the entire company of the Mayflower came ashore. And the women used this opportunity to wash those dirty clothes that hadn't been able to be washed since they left because water was at a premium. And uh, forever after, it's, it's important to note here, it's uh, forever after in New England, for years and years and years, Monday was the traditional day that women did the laundry. Now they went back to the ship and uh, they decided that they would do some exploration. Now there were two goals. One goal was to make contact with the Native Americans to probably establish good relations and hopefully trade, a trade for food because they needed food, they were low on food. Uh, and also to find a location to uh, build a town or build their colony. So this was the dual uh, mission of these explorers. And the first exploration set out on November 15th and it lasted till the 17th. There would be three explorations or expeditions in all. Now this map that you're looking at, I found in an 1865 edition of Mort's Relation. It's the H.M. Dexter map. Now Dexter, what he did was he took Mort's Relation and he created a map showing the approximate location of their journeys during these expeditions. Now uh, you don't have to go find some antique bookstore to find this map. You can go on a site, it's called archive.org where they have uh, dutifully uh, recorded and scanned many of these antique books, and that's where I found this. So we'll be using this to track in the footsteps of the pilgrims here. All right. So they begin right about here, right where they landed. And that day uh, that they landed on that first day of the exploration, there were 16 men. Again, the shallop was not ready. They came in the longboat. Almost as soon as they hit the beach, <clears throat> they saw in the distance five Native Americans who had dogs, oddly enough, and they started to try to approach these Native Americans. What happened was the Native Americans, members probably of the Nauset tribe, saw them coming and they escaped into the woods. So what happened was this expedition decided to try to follow them to try to make contact. And this is what they did. So we'll focus in, this is where uh, the expedition went. Follow the red line. We're going by Dexter's map again. And if you follow Dexter's map, the line pretty much goes right through the heart of Provincetown. But Provincetown wasn't there, obviously. It was all wooded. They reached Duck Pond. Now, they were doing a combination of uh, following by sight and also tracking. As you see here, from Duck Pond, they went up to what is now called Oakhead, which is uh, quite a big promontory. You, you can see for quite a distance. And it said that when they got up to that point, they could see those five men walking in the distance. So they walked in that distance trying to follow them. Now, I should mention that if you've ever been out here, it's all dunes. But at that point, it was uh, wooded because uh, most of the wood was cut down for building or fires and the dunes ensued after that. And from here, if we look at uh, the map, they walked this distance here. And uh, I just wanted to go back to the slide because if you look here on the HM Dexter slide, this at one time, this is called Pilgrim Lake here. It's enclosed now. In the uh, 1800s, they built a railroad through here and they closed it up. During the time of the Pilgrims, this was an open bay. And actually this area in here was an area called Stouts Creek. And this is an important location that is not marked by any marker. 
And here we look across Pilgrim Lake towards that site, which would have been over here. And I did, I took a hike out there and took this photograph. I was looking for some place that had some remnants of where there might have been water, and this is the closest I got. Now, this is important because this, is, this site out here somewhere, uh, hopefully within this photograph, is where the pilgrims spent their first night on American soil at Stouts Creek. And there's no monument out there, probably because it might be buried by the wind and the dunes. Now, the next day they woke and they decided to continue to follow the tracks that they could see. And it took them down the cave. And here's the direction that they went. And they came to an area called Pilgrim Spring. And you can get here very easily. There's a parking lot not too far from it. And it's just a short walk through these woods. And there is a monument here. I'll show it to you. If you can take a minute or two and read this. Or a moment, I should say. Now, uh, Clayton and I were talking uh, before the lecture about how water was really at a premium in England. And when they drank this water, they, they were so stupefied. They just thought it was the best thing they had ever tasted. And if you go there today, that's where the monument is. And that spring that they found 400 years later is still there. You can still walk over and see that, that water that they drank. To give you an idea, this, this really cuts to the chase. This gives you an idea of how they uh, really savored this water. Uh, this is a quote from Mort's relation. Found a fresh spring of water, of which we were heartily glad and sat us down and drunk our first New England water with a delight as ever we drunk a drink in all of our lives. So this water was really good. And if you look at this, this uh, painting, that kind of gives you the idea too. And these guys were really thirsty after marching for a day and a half. So once they all had their fill of water here at Pilgrim Spring, they uh, went back towards Cape Cod Bay and it, they got to the shore, and what they did was they lit a signal fire. This was to let the, the Mayflower know that they were okay and that they were going to continue on, on their exploration, and they did. From here, they went to another location that has a monument. It's called Pilgrim Pond, not to be confused with Pilgrim Lake up here, and that's in North Truro, and this is plainly marked. If you go there today, it's a nice quiet spot. It has a monument on the rock here. And uh, when they first came upon this pond, they, they pretty much just noted it and, and bypassed it. But later that night, they would come back and they would camp in this location. And here it is. It, as I say, it's a very nice place. You can come sit in one of the park benches here and just contemplate how the pilgrims camped here 400 years ago. And here's a kind of a nice video I shot one evening showing the Pilgrim Pond, trying to capture what it might have looked like when the Pilgrims were there. So from Pilgrim Pond, they continued down the coast and they got to an area called Corn Hill. But before they reached Corn Hill, it seems that they ran, by an accident, they ran into a Native American burial ground. This is what Mortz has to say. We, we found a little path to certain heaps of sand, one whereof was covered with old mats and a wooden thing like a mortar overwhelmed on top of it. And an earthen pot laid a little hole at the end thereof. We, mussing what it might be, digged and found a bow. And we thought arrows, but they were rotten. We suppose that there were many other things, but we deem them graves. We put the bow back and made it up again as it was, left the rest, rest untouched because we thought it would be odious unto them, the Native Americans, to ransack their sepulchres, their graves. So they came across this burial ground. They, they did it by accident, realized they were on a grave and covered it back up. 
And then they proceeded to this area that's now called Corn Hill. Let's focus in. Here's Corn Hill. As you see here, this is from the satellite. You can't really make out that it's a hill. But they reached this area and they found the site of a village, which they thought was abandoned. Here's a, here's a short video showing uh, Corn Hill from the parking lot there. You can see it in the distance. Here's another shot. That's up Corn Hill. Now, as I said, they thought they found an abandoned village. Uh, the wigwams did not look like this. They looked probably like this. And this was actually a seasonal village. The natives moved in the summer towards the shore and then inland during the winter. And uh, it wasn't abandoned. It was just abandoned until they came back the next spring. But they poked around and they, they found something pretty amazing. They found a ship's kettle. This was a giant iron kettle. And obviously the, the natives did not have the technology to build this thing, to make this thing. And uh, they must have had some kind of contact with Europeans. And they sculpted around a little bit further and they found what is called seed corn. And uh, it was in bags like you see here, buried. Now it was buried because the village, when they came back in the spring, this was the corn they were going to use to sow their seeds and plant their crops. It is edible, but it was supposed to be used for seeds. The pilgrims saw this, and this was like the answer to their prayers. They knew they were running out of food, and they needed this corn, and they took it. Now, a lot is made out of this, that they stole the Native Americans' corn. They did. They, they needed to. But it's not usually repeated that uh, about a year later, they did pay them back for the corn that they did take. They realized what they were doing, but they were in a, a sticky situation where they needed to do it. And it must be noted that in the spring, that village, when they came back, there was no corn to plant. And what were they to do? They probably had to depend on their neighbors that were around them. And the natives knew this happened. They were not happy when they found out this happened. And here is a monument marking the location. And uh, I found out a few days ago from an old, old time Cape Cotter, if you go up on that hill in the backyard of one of those houses in the brush, there's another monument up there. And here's a painting showing them finding this corn, loading it up. They took the kettle, loaded that up with corn, took those bags, and set off. Now, uh, as they were at Corn Hill, they sent an expedition out because they knew that there was a mouth of a river here. It's now the, called the Pamet River. And they explored here. And if you read Mort's Relations, they, they found a palisade, a wooden palisade. And in Mortz, it says they deemed that it was built by Christians. And when I read this year, years ago, I was like, yeah, what Christians? Who, who are they talking about? They never speculate as to who, it could have, who could have been there and built it. But if you do a little research, it's pretty easy to find out. There was an expedition in 1603, the Martin Pring expedition, and they came to Cape Cod and they, they uh, stopped in this general location to harvest sassafras, wild sassafras, which was brought back to England. It was valuable because of its medicinal uh, properties. So this in all likelihood was probably uh, somewhat of a fencing that was put around uh, in, an encampment that was uh, put there by Martin Fring and his expedition. So they uh, decided that they would head back. So they headed back to Pilgrim Pond there. They spent the night there and they set a signal fire to let the Mayflower know that they were ready to be picked up. And they did a little further exploration before they did the final call. And uh, if you read Mort's relation, it's kind of uh, uh, written with a bit of levity. Uh, you, you can kind of sense that they thought this was funny. As they were exploring uh, William Bradford, who would be the second governor of the colony later on, 
uh, got his foot caught in a deer trap and was yanked up by his ankles and was hanging by his ankles from a tree. Uh, I think everybody there thought it was pretty funny. Probably not Bradford, though. And I think from there they thought, uh, I think we've had it for now. Let's, let's go back to the Mayflower. So they had two of their musketeers uh, load up their um, matchlock muskets, which you see here, are like handheld cannons pretty much. And they signaled, and a boat was sent out to bring the men back. Now, they didn't reach any of their objectives. They didn't come across any Native Americans. They saw some. They didn't make any contact. They did find villages. They didn't find a location to build a, a settlement, though. So they decided to do another expedition. This one took place uh, November 28th till December 1st. And this time, the, the shallop was ready. And 24 men went on this one, and they were led by Captain Christopher Jones. And uh, that night, some men were put on shore, and some men spent the night in the shallop. And the next morning, they set out to investigate the Pamet River, which we already, they had already found the mouth of the river. Now they wanted to go up the river and explore the river. Now, what they planned to do was have the shallop go up the river, but also have a contingent of men on the shore walking parallel. And this is what they did. They went following the, the course of the Pamet River here. And they got to about this point, and they spent their first night. And from what I've read, it seems that they, they weren't too happy with the terrain. They didn't find any Native Americans. So they decided the next day just to head back to the mouth of the river, and that's what they did. Okay. And it's here that the shallop is sent back with corn. Eighteen men remained to do further exploration. Uh, and Bradford notes in of Plymouth Plantation that they sent the weakest back with the corn and the shallop. So the next day, the, the uh, expedition continued. Let's focus in. Here's where the expedition went. Again, they're looking for Native Americans and a place to settle. And they found something that they didn't expect. It was here in this location that they found a grave of a man with yellow hair and a small child. Now, this has always fascinated me when I, I came across this years ago, as I, probably as a young man, that uh, this, this was out of place, a grave of a man with blonde hair, basically, and a child. I thought maybe this was the the grave of Thorwald the Viking from a thousand years ago, but that doesn't seem realistic. Uh, and when you read into this, you can kind of deign from the information what this man, uh, who this man probably was. And I'm going to explain to you what my theory is. But first, here's what, here's what they said in Mort's relation about this grave. Into a, a plain ground, we found a place like a grave, but much bigger. It was covered with boards. They took up the boards to find a woven mat. Under the mat, they found bowls, trays, dishes, and such trinkets. We opened the greater part and found a great quantity of fine, perfect red powder, and in it, the bones and the skull of a man. The skull had fine yellow hair on it, some flesh unconsumed. There was bound, it was bound up with a pack knife, and two or three odd iron things. It was bound up in a sailor's canvas cassock and a pair of breeches. We opened the less bundle likewise and found the bones and the head of a little child. About the legs and other parts of it were bound strings and bracelets of fine white meats. There was also a little bow about three quarters long and some other naps. We brought sundry of the prettiest things away with us and covered up the corpse again. So you wonder, who, who was this man? Now, here's my theory, and, and it's, it's kind of a sidetrack, but 
let's let's look at this. If you learned anything about the Pilgrims, you probably learned about Squanto. He was the Native American who could speak English, and he helped them plant corn. We all know that from our, our elementary school. Now, Squanto has quite a story. How did he learn English? Well, he was kidnapped in 1614 by a Captain Hunt, and he was brought to Magdala, Spain, and sold as a slave. And somehow he, was, he escaped and he got to England, and there he was befriended by people. He learned English, and then he came back to America as a guide and a scout with a Captain Thomas Dermer in 1619. Now, Squanto, the first place he wanted to go was his village where he had been kidnapped from, and that village was called Patuxet. It's in the general location of where Plymouth is today. Now, when Dermer and Squanto landed, they found that Patuxet had been absolutely and totally wiped out. There was not a soul left, not by English, not by Indian. It was by a plague, an unknown disease that wiped out, it said, 80 to 90 percent of the coastal natives in this area. And can you imagine how Squanto felt when he came to his village to to be welcomed by his family, and nobody was left alive by this time. I guess when he gathered himself up, he was able to uh, direct Derma to the leader of the Wampanoag Nation, who lived in a village in uh, what is now Rhode Island. It was called Sowams. And the leader of the Wampanoag Nation was the Massasoit. That means great chief. And I think a lot of people thought that was his name. All these years we talked about the Massasoit. His name was actually Osamequin, which meant yellow feather. And he was the leader of a nation. This is a group of tribes that have formed a, a somewhat of a confederation. And that was the Wampanoag people. Now, in talking to Massasoit, uh, they found some interesting things. But first, I want to show you something. This is the present day site of where Soams was, the village uh, that Massasoit lived in. It's Warren, Rhode Island, and it doesn't look like you can see too much evidence of Native Americans here. There's just one thing left here that can tell you that there's an inkling that there was once a Native village here, and that is what's called Massasoit Spring. This is the actual spring where the Natives got their water in the village. Now, while they were talking to Massasoit, uh, he brought out two white men that had been held captive, and they were French, and turned them over to Dermer and Squanto. And they found out where these men had come from. It seems that a ship, a French ship, went down off the coast of Cape Cod. The survivors, the ones that didn't die in the wreck, were taken captive by the Native Americans, probably the Nauset, and then pretty much sold into slavery. Uh, Squanto and Derma would also redeem another captive up in what is uh, now the Weymouth area, which was called Massachusetts, after the Massachusetts tribe. My theory was this man, the man with the yellow hair, was probably one of these men. And that ship's kettle that they found in Cornhill probably went with this ship. But the thing uh, I, I find interesting is this man wasn't buried like a slave. He seemed to be buried in a position of honor. And also he had a child with him. So you wonder if he integrated with the tribe somehow and became quite prominent, had a son, and somehow they were both killed and buried at that site. I don't know. That's my theory. You can tell for yourself whether you think that's the truth or not. Well, back to the expedition. Um, they went further, and then they found uh, the location of another abandoned village. This is how Mortz relates it. They found some Indian wigwams which had been lately dwelt in. They having their pieces, that meant their guns, and hearing nobody entered the houses and took some things. The writer notes that they intended to have some beads to leave, quote, in a sign of peace and that they meant to truck 
or trade with them, unquote. But this was not done because of, quote, the hasty coming, hasty coming away from Cape Cod. So I, I guess that pretty much says that they meant to have stuff to trade, but they forgot it. And they were going to trade, but they didn't. So they just took stuff. Uh, the, the excuse for that is not really as good as the excuse for um, Corn Hill. This was simple theft. And then they went to the coast and fired off a few shots, and the Mayflower picked them up again. Still not having reached the objective of founding, uh, finding any uh, Native Americans or a site to live, they launched a third expedition. And this time, it was the shallop again. This time, it was only with 10 men, 10 of their principal men. Now, the weather was getting colder. The seasons were changing. Uh, there was snow in the air in some cases. And uh, they came in, and it was an icy day. They came in off the coast of what is now Wellfleet. And it's said in, uh, I, I believe, in... Um, um, William Bradford's up from the plantation that they espied 10 or 12 Indians busy about a black thing. What was that black thing? It was later found that the black thing was a grampus fish, which had washed up on shore and they were probably cutting meat off of it. Now the natives, once they saw the, uh, the shallop approaching, they ran inland. So they decided and they landed a league or two away from where they saw the Indians. And this is where they landed. And they came in here, and this is where they spent the night. Now this location is interesting. This is uh, near Great Pond, as you can see, but there's also, it's, uh, this whole area is the Willie Park in Easton. It's a very pretty place, as you can see. And I walked through the woods here, thinking that I might find something from that one night they camped there. Obviously, it's impossible. And uh, from that point, the company split uh, two on shore and eight on the shallop. And the shallop went up the coast, and the men went inland, and they crossed two brooks. Here, they finally they found the grampus fish that was being cut up uh, a day earlier. And they followed the track of the Indians down the coast. Now, it's at this point that they lost sight of the shallop, and they just returned uh, to the camp here. Now, on the next day, they set out, and they went inland. And it was here that they found a giant native burial ground. And this is, uh, this is how they relate it. They found a great burial place, a part where uh, was encompassed with a large palisade, like a churchyard. The graves were more sumptuous than the ones at Corn Hill, yet we digged none of them up, but only viewed them and went on our way. We also found four or five Indian houses, but no natives. So they continued, and they went towards the coast, hoping to hook up with the shallop again, which they did. And they uh, hooked up with the shallop at a place that is now called First Encounter Beach. Let's focus in on that area. And here's a video I shot. Now the shallop was pulled up just beyond the waterline, as you see it here. And they made uh, somewhat of a camp or a barricade in the wood line, which probably would have been where the dunes are, you're seeing here, and they spent the night. Now it's recorded that throughout the night they were hearing mysterious howlings and animal sounds, so much so that they were coming to alarm. They were coming and getting their muskets ready, thinking that they might be attacked at any moment. Now that attack never came during the night, but as they were getting their things ready to go and put, put them in the shallow, an attack did come. The Nosset fell upon them, firing arrows. They went to their muskets. They fired back. It was a quick skirmish. And oddly enough, nobody was hit. I guess they were bad shots on either side. But this was the Nosset people. They were angry. They were angry that they were going through their graves. They were going through their villages, stealing their corn, and they attacked them. 
Now the pilgrims jumped back on that shallop and headed out. Now, if you go to Eastham uh, and you visit First Encounter Beach today, this is the monument that you'll find. It's just kind of stuck in the sand here. And as you can see, it's very weathered from the blowing sand and the salt. Now, they figured at this point, uh, maybe Cape Cod isn't a good place to try to live. Uh, now we've angered these people and they're not going to be very amenable to us staying here. So they decided to go about 15 leagues down the coast, as they said. Now the weather got bad. It got uh, windy. It was snowing. The uh, rudder on the, on the shallop broke and then the mast broke. They were in real trouble here. And they had to find some place to land this, this thing. And they came in and they scudded in and landed on this island right here, right off of Saquish in Plymouth Harbor. This, this uh, island that you see here is Clark's Island, named after the pilot of the Mayflower, John Clark. And it was December 9th, 1620 that they landed. On the 10th, they explored the island. And then on the 11th, they held their Sabbath service. It was a Sunday. And as they were strict Calvinists, they did nothing that entire day but uh, pray and uh, think of uh, and read their scripture. And here is the marking on that rock there on Clark's Island. Clark's Island is now private property. The only time you can get out there is if you hook up with the Duxbury Rural and Historical Society. They go out there once a year on a picnic day. Now, this brings us to this thing. We all know what this is. And you know, there is no primary source that says anybody stepped on this stone. This is the only primary source from the day that they landed in Plymouth. Uh, that, that next day, that Monday, we, we marched also into the land and found diverse cornfields, little running brooks, and a place very good for a situation. So I think they found a good place to live. No mention of the rock. But we do have romantic paintings showing all these people landing on the rock. The first landing uh, has women and children on it. And we know from Mortz that there were only men on this expedition. It said that Mary Chilton was the first to step on Plymouth Rock. She wasn't with them. Very romanticized 19th century uh, illustrations and paintings. And here we have it, Plymouth Rock. And you know, my students say to me, they say, Mr. Daly, you know that rock's fake. And they know everything because they have those things called cell phones. Well, you have to look at the facts and I'll let you be the judge. Let me give you the background on this so-called Plymouth Rock. Uh, in 1741, Elder Thomas Fonts, who was 95, found out that they were going to build a wharf over this rock thus burying it. He became very agitated, very upset, and asked to be brought out to this rock. Now, he couldn't even walk at this time. He was so advanced in age. They had to put him in a chair and carry him out here. And while he was there, touching it and weeping, he explained to people that his father told him that he knew people from that original Mayflower that told him that was the rock that they first stepped off on when they landed in Plymouth. And uh, they didn't end up bearing it probably because of his protestations. That's one strong story for that this is really it. Now, an elder in the church is somebody held in high esteem. There was also in 1750, not too long after the 1600s, this stone was marked as a landmark on a map in 1715 
Later in 1774, the location was recorded on the Blaskowitz map. Now, people knew of this, not only from elder fonts, but it seems to be have been some general knowledge about this. And by the time of the American Revolution, uh, when Mother Country was about to split from the colonies, the uh, colonists were looking to, to recreate their history. They wanted to look back and, and have a, a beginning, uh, kind of like a Romulus and Remus mythology. They looked back to these people as forefathers, and they needed tangible icons to have, to venerate, so to say. That rock was perfect. So what they decided to do shortly before the American Revolution was take some oxen down here with ropes and pulleys and try to haul that thing out of the mud to bring it here and place it right here in town square. Now, what happened was as they were lifting it out of the mud, the rope broke and the rock fell and split in half. Now, the folks back then saw this as like an omen or a metaphor. This is the mother country breaking away from the colonies. And this was uh, something that they, they really, they believed this was foretelling the future. So they left the bottom half of that rock down on the beach, and they brought the top half up here where it would rest until the 1800s. Now, during the revolution, a flag flew here that said, Liberty or death. Now, this is the location whereabouts it was probably enshrined here. Now, after years of sitting in this spot, people would come from far and wide, and a lot of them would try to chip a piece off of it. So the rock was actually getting smaller just by virtue of people chipping away at it. And on July 4th, 1834, it was moved, and it was moved in front of here. This is Pilgrim Hall in Plymouth, the, the uh, nation's oldest museum. And here is a picture of it in front of Pilgrim Hall. It did remain here till the age of photography. Now the same thing, people came here from far and wide to see this rock where our forefathers first stepped off. And then in 1867, it was moved again. A stone portico was built down on the, on the harbor, and the top half was placed here, and people would come and visit it there. As you can see, this became a tourist magnet. And then in 1880, the bottom half was reunited with the top half, as you see here. This is why you see that cement line. They cemented it back together again. And then in 1920, for the 300th anniversary, it was moved here under this beautiful Roman Doric portico at the original site where Elder Fonts went down and wept over it. And this is the rock that we see here today. And I leave it up to you. Do you think this is real or do you think like my students that this is fake? Now, the expedition found the place, a situation, a place to stay, and they went back to the Mayflower, which had been still anchoring uh, off the coast of where P-Town is now. Now, William Bradford, when he arrived back in the Mayflower, he got some bad news. His wife, Dorothy Bradford, had either fallen or slipped overboard into the icy water and perished. Now, some people have speculated that she jumped, and it is odd that Bradford didn't note anything in his journal about this whatsoever. Now, they brought the Mayflower to Plymouth. They uh, left uh, Cape Cod Bay on the 15th, and they were in Plymouth Harbor by the 16th. And on the 18th, they explored the land and they found that they had sighted their village uh, where there were, were a lot of open cornfields. It was all cleared. And it's interesting uh, to note, a lot of folks say that, oh, Plymouth was built right on top of Squanto's village in Patuxent. And I thought that for a long time too. Uh, and then I started to doubt that because if you read the sources, 
There's no evidence of any uh, wigwams at the site, but there is evidence that they probably built their village on their cornfields. Now, I came across an article in 1980 that was written in 1986 that a uh, development was going in right about here. And the article didn't say where it was, but it did say that while they were clearing the land and digging it up, that they found a plethora of Native American artifacts. And they even speculated in the article that this might be the actual site of that village of, so of uh, uh, Squanto's vi uh, village here. Um, I looked at that and I wondered, where is this? What, what is the actual location? So I decided to go through the Mass Archaeological Society records and I came up with an archaeological dig that they did really shortly on the heels of this. And it was that location. And the, even the archaeologists were astounded at the amount of artifacts and how long that village had been there. And they did say that in all likelihood, this was the site of Patuxet. And they did list the location of this. It was Leland Way in Plymouth. So the likelihood is that is the location of where the village was, the Native American village. And this is where the plantation would be. Now, this great plague that wiped out the entire village, as I said, took about 80 to 90 percent of the natives. And... Uh, many have speculated that it was a European disease. It probably was. Uh, but what disease was it? Some people say smallpox. Some people say that it was probably yellow fever. Uh, but if you look at the symptoms that were listed, it, it's probably neither of those. It's really hard to judge what was this disease. The symptoms were uh, the victim would get a headache, then they'd get a fever, they bleed from the nose profusely and they become jaundiced or yellow and they would die within a few days. Now, it couldn't be yellow fever because that's a summertime disease and uh, there's records of people dying from this in the winter. Uh, we do have records of Europeans intermingling with the natives with this and they did not catch it, which tells me that Europeans had some kind of immunity to whatever this was but it wiped out 80 to 90% of the coastal Indians. Not so bad down in Rhode Island. The Narragansett uh, nation down in Rhode Island didn't suffer as badly as the Wampanoag. But it was here that the pilgrims decided to settle. And it was a pretty good spot. There was high ground. You could see enemies coming from miles around, fresh water streams, good harbor, and the land was all cleared and ready to go. And this is where they decided to stay. Now immediately they set upon building this new colony. Uh, they began to build on December 23rd, 1620. And on December 25th, they worked the entire day. They did not celebrate Christmas. There is no mention of Jesus's birth, the date of it that is in the Bible. So they did not believe that the, the 25th was the birth date of Jesus. And also on the 25th, they heard, they heard noises, quote, of the Indians. So the natives are aware of what's going on. They're watching from the woods. And it said that they were, they were mystified because normally what they saw were men with armor and weapons. And here they have men, women, and children, and they look like they're building permanent buildings here. So they were very uh, mystified by what was going on here. And it's here on the 28th, they drew up a plan of what the town would look like. And this is where that first street is. This is Leiden Street. And when I take people down here, I always say, look down that street. That's the first street in New England you're looking at. And here's the, the satellite shot, and here's Leiden Street. Now, here are the locations of the first buildings that they put up. The first common house, the common house was a big house used to sleep many people, and they would sleep there while they were building the rest of the town. And also they had to put fortifications up on the hill, which is now Burial Hill. First it was a gun platform, and then later a fort would be built here. 
Now, here are some 19th century depictions of what the fort might have looked like. And we now know that they didn't build log cabin -y type houses. Uh, they're, they're, that was the Dutch over in New York that built in that, that manner. Uh, the fort probably looked a lot like this. This is the fort at Plymouth Plantation. And uh, my sources tell me that they did a lot of research in, in designing this. This is what you call a blockhouse. And this is the type of fort that they used actually in Ireland to subdue the Irish. And they brought this design over here in all likelihood. And if you want to find the site of that fort, you'd have to go up to Burial Hill. Now it's clearly marked where it was. There's two markers. That's the site of, that's probably the middle of where the fort was. Many people don't know this though. If you go and look among the graves, you'll notice kind of a cut in a straight lines. And what that is, it's the outline of the actual fort. You can still make out the outline of where that fort actually was. And here is the plan of Plymouth Plantation superimposed on the modern day map of Plymouth, showing where all the folks live. That's in my little booklet too, if you want to take a look at that. And if you go down there today, uh, many of these house sites are marked where, they're, where they formerly were. Like for instance, on the corner here, this is Governor Bradford's house. That's where he lived. And oddly enough, his neighbor across the street was John Billington, who is kind of a ruffian and was the first man executed for murder in the colonies. Now, about the 29th and the 30th, they saw to the west, uh, quote, great smokes of the natives. Now, this could have been one of two things. They could have just been burning off underbrush, which they did regularly, or they could have been trying to frighten the colonists, which, which it is, we don't know. Um, and on February 16th, uh, some people out working saw 12 Indians on the march. So they ran back to the town and everybody went to alarm. Everybody grabbed their musket. They were ready for an attack. Nothing came. And then the next day on February 17th, right about this location, just on the side of the river that separates the hill you see to the left and the village, over, which would be to your right, uh, two Native Americans came to the side of the river, probably around this location, and motioned to the people in the village to come talk to parlay, as they said. And then Miles Standish and Stephen Hopkins came to the opposite side of the river and did pretty much the same thing. So they both stood there saying, come and talk, come and talk. And the natives lost heart and they ran back up the hill. And then according to uh, Mortz, they heard a great woo, like there were many warriors out there in the woods. And this caused some great alarm among the, the pilgrims. Now, it'd be more than a month before anything else would happen. And that happened on March 16th, 1620, when Samoset, 1621, I should say, Samoset, a sachem from Maine, strode right into the middle of their village, looked them in the eye and said, welcome English. They were astounded, not by his, uh, just the fact that he could speak English, but he was half naked in March. And the Indians could dress like this because they had acclimated themselves to the cold weather. Now, Massasoit Osamequin had sent him to find out what was going on here. They, they were wondering why men, women, and children, and they're building houses. So he was on, on kind of a fact-finding mission, but they also got some information from him as well. They found out that... Uh, the Massasoit, the chief of the Wampanoag, his village was to the south, Soams. And to the east were the Nauset people who were very mad at them. They're the ones that attacked them. And they were very close to the village of Patuxet that had been wiped out by the plague and no one possessed it. So they learned all these things. And then uh, after a little while, Samoset left. And then on March 18th, he returned with five other men. And here is how it's recounted here. Um, on this day again came the savage, brought with him five other tall and proper men, 
they have every man a deer skin or such like on one arm. Uh, they had most of them long hosen up to their groins, close made above the groins to their waist was leather. They were altogether like Irish trousers. They are complexion like our English gypsies, no hair or very little on their faces or on their, uh, on their heads. They had long hair to their shoulders, only cut before some trussed up with a feather broadwise like a fan, another a fox tail hanging out. So this gives us a good description of what these uh, Wampanoag looked like at that time. Pretty close to what you see in these pictures here. And then on March 22nd, Samoset returned with this man, Squanto. As we know, Squanto could speak English. And Squanto and Samoset said that Massasoit, the Massasoit and his brother were nearby with men. And the next day they appeared. They appeared on this promontory here, Watson's Hill. It was Massasoit and 60 of his men came and they looked down on the village here. Now, Edward Winslow was sent over bearing gifts and hostages were exchanged. This is so neither side would pull any monkey business. And Massasoit was described as looking just like the rest of them. The only thing that set him apart was a necklace made of bone. And this is the statue that is up on Coles Hill representing Osamequin, which probably is very accurate from the descriptions we see in Mort's. He was escorted into the village uh, like a king and then brought down to the common house where he sat down with the governor who was John Carver at that time. And they had a parlay. And it is here that they created the first treaty between the pilgrims and the Wampanoag. And this is the treaty. Now, Massasoit did not come because he, he, want, he felt bad for these people. He wanted to help them. And it was all self-interest on both sides. Massasoit knew that he was uh, in trouble because the, the nation to his south, the Narragansett, were encroaching on his territory because they knew that his numbers had been, uh, his numbers, uh, had been decimated due to the plague. They, they fared a lot better, and he was afraid that they would invade and take over his territory. So he needed an ally. And the pilgrims were the perfect ally. They had muskets, they had cannon, they had men that could fight. And on the other side, it was the same situation. The pilgrims needed an ally. They were surrounded by Native Americans. They didn't know who, what tribes. They already angered the Nauset. They could come back again. So they needed an ally in Massasoit. And that's why they made this treaty. This, this outlines this relationship. And it also says if... Uh, one of their party injures one of the others that they'll send them to the other side for punishment, which was, is a very simple treaty. And it lasted for 55 years. This is the site where that treaty was signed. Although the building is no longer there, you can still see the plaque that marks the site. Now, this is the site of the common house, the first house. Um, where they where they met and uh it's also important to note this is also where many of the pilgrims died that first year uh they started getting sick earlier in the winter most of them came over they already had scurvy which depletes your immune system and they just caught all sorts of things and they by uh, march they were dropping like flies and uh this as time passed, uh, many of them died. Over 50% of their number perished. This uh, graphic here shows very, very um, well how many people passed on. Here we see it. The ones that are in gray are the ones that died. Now, these folks were buried on Cole, what is now Coles Hill. In unmarked graves. And the reason they did that was they didn't want the natives to know that their numbers had dwindled so much, that they were so weak. And they were left there. And then in the 1930s, 
uh, I'm sorry, the 1920s, when they had the 300th anniversary, they were doing some uh, excavation up there and they discovered a lot of the bones of these people. Now, originally, they took these bones and they placed them in the portico. The, there was a little uh, attic above the portico above Plymouth Rock. But after a while, people thought that wasn't really a, an appropriate place to put the bones of these first settlers. And they created this sarcophagus that you see here. And this is where those bones were placed. And their names are all written on the side here, the folks that did not make it that first year. Now, the ones that did make it, they got through that harsh winter. We know how Squanto helped them plant the corn, and they made it. They survived. And they made it to have not a Thanksgiving, but a harvest festival. That's what you see here. This is something that they did in Europe all the time. After the harvest was brought in, there was a big party to celebrate the fact that they'd have enough food to get them through the winter, and they're not going to die. And the Indians showed up too, and they had some venison. And they did have fowl. They didn't mention any turkey. This was a three-day party, basically. Now, somehow this has morphed into what we call Thanksgiving today. But it is a very special moment in that for one brief shining moment, these two cultures did get along together they did share, and they uh, had this uh, one moment of peace. It wouldn't be more than a year before the, the two cultures would be fighting, and there would be death. Now, if you want to see what a real separatist or Puritan Thanksgiving would look like, this is what it would look like. The separatists, so they did have Thanksgivings but they were spent all day in church and they were spent praying and fasting, not gorging and watching football games. So I'd like to leave you with this thought. Uh, this, this Thanksgiving, think and pause and remember the story of the pilgrims and take some time away from the festivities if you're having them with this COVID thing going on and go to a quiet place and give thanks as the pilgrims did 400 years ago. And I thank you for having me. And I guess at this point, um, uh, Margaret can read if, if there are any questions or people can unmike and they can ask a question if they'd like to. Okay. And Margaret says if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat or you could just simply unmike. We did have one uh, comment. It was just kind of very general, um, okay. but just about the archaeological dig database. I know you mentioned mm -hmm. doing an archaeological dig, so maybe if you could expand on where you access that, I think is what right. their question was. Uh, the, it's, uh, I found it, I think, on the Mass Archaeological Society website, and I believe that they have links to uh, some of the digs that they've done over time. And that, that's not the state. That's a, that's a society of amateur archaeologists that's been going on for years and years and years. The state archaeologists, that's something separate. This was not a state dig. That was the only one I've seen so far. Um, okay. Everyone who's still on, if you'd like, feel free to post a question there in the chat. Oh, um, we have one here. Um, what is the source of the 1621 feast? Uh, Bradford's of Plymouth Plantation. Uh, it's quite, there's a pretty good uh, description of it. And as I said, they, uh, they had venison, they had fowl, probably some of the crops that they raised. Uh, and uh, it was a three-day feast, basically. They had shooting contests, they had wrestling matches. I have another one here. Um... Why did so many die the first year? Just if you could just. Oh, okay. Uh, many died that first year. Coming over on the ship, many people got scurvy from lack of vitamin C and that depletes the immune system. 
Also, it was cold. Many people got off uh, when they got off those ships in the cold water, gave them a chill. So they were getting pneumonia, uh, those types of things they were dying from. Um, I have another, where do you think Patuxent Village is? Um, well, if you go by uh, what I said in the article, it's um, probably Leland Road. Um, in the original 1986 article, they did mention, I, I believe, because they didn't want relic hunters going down there. And then there was a follow-up to that. The Hornblower family donated the land mm -hmm. for Plymouth Plantation. And did yeah. they have family on the Mayflower? I'm not aware of that. I know that Henry Hornblower was an avid uh, student of uh, Plymouth Plantation, but I, I don't know if he had any lineage going back to the Mayflower. Did anyone else have any other questions? We do have a lot of just comments on YouTube and Facebook, just thanking you for mm -hmm. a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And it was very comprehensive. So a lot of positive feedback there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Someone says they posted questions. Mm -hmm. um, let me see. Um, so see. Yeah, we already looked at two of those. Do you have an additional oh. one on your end? How soon before women came over? Uh, there were women on the Mayflower. Um, did single people, workers, really live in homes with the families? Yeah, they decided to do that. Uh, the servants lived uh, with the families, and if there was anybody single, they were assigned to live with a family. That That is true. And let's see, I think I have one more here. Um, was the King Philip's War the end of Native American presence in the area? Uh, yeah, as, as a... Um, Yes, pretty much so. Uh, there were still Native Americans here after that in small pockets, but after King Philip's War, uh, their numbers were decimated. Uh, many people were sold into slavery. Uh, a lot of the Native Americans were sold into slavery down into the, uh, the um, West Indies. Um, and then I have two more here. Um, do you know what started the fighting a year later? Um, yeah, uh, that was basically because another colony was planted in what is now Weymouth down in West Augusta. And these colonists uh, had no, uh, I, I guess I've always said they were kind of the dregs of London and they began, they ate up all their food very quickly. They began to steal from the local natives. Uh, it's even said that they were meddling with their women, whatever that means for the time. And the Massachusetts, who were the tribe over there, were livid. And they were ready to attack not only that colony, but also Plymouth. Now, at the same time, Massasoit became deathly ill. And Edward Winslow went out and kind of nursed him back to life. And uh, in a way of thanking him, he tipped Winslow off to the uh, impending attack. And what they did was they made a preemptive strike. They went out there with nine men, Habamock, Miles Standish. They rounded up the two leaders of the tribe and murdered them, basically. And then they went after chasing other Native Americans around the woods. So that, that's how that happened. That's the West Augusta incident. Um, there's, it looks like there's two more here. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you'd like those to be your last two. Um, there's one, mm -hmm. how much cattle or livestock was brought on the Mayflower? Uh, I don't think any cattle. They did bring cattle over later because there was a cattle division in, in 1627. Uh, there's another one here. What town did the pilgrims settle after Plymouth? That would be Duxbury. Uh, and shortly thereafter, there were towns on the Cape also, um, Marshfield, settled in the 1630s, these, these areas. But I, I don't think they brought out any cattle over initially. I might be mistaken, though. I know they didn't have horses, that's for sure. And then there's a question, why does Plymouth claim all of the events of the 400th anniversary um, mm. took place there rather than on the Upper Cape? 
Uh, if, if you go to Provincetown, I'm sure they're having festivities as well. There's always been somewhat of a rivalry between Plymouth and Provincetown about that very matter. Where, where did they land first? And that's why Provincetown has that giant monument there to remind people that that's the first place that they landed. And I have no new questions after that, okay. just an, uh, more compliments and a lot of thank, thank you. yous for your presentation. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay, well then. Yeah, well, we thank you so much um, for presenting and for joining us. And we thank all of you for joining us this evening. Um, and thank you for your great questions. Okay. Thank you, Margaret. And thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Have a great night, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>